The Ford Escort name means a lot to people, and it meant a lot to people too. And that's why they decided to keep it for the Mark III. It was originally going to be called the Ford Erica because it was wholly different. The old Mark I and Mark II were real drive, and this one, front wheel drive, and fully independent suspension at the rear too. It cost $1 billion of development. That's more than the 800 million odd for the Sierra. My goodness did the Mark III Escort sell. Fundamentally, it's a modern design and it looks like it too. And in fact, ahead of the Golf and the Astra at the time, it had a slightly different rear boot lid that made it look more mature and more modern at the time too. And it gave you better boot space. So in terms of a packaging thing, it was also superior. What else? Well, because it's a Ford, of course it drives well. So let's find out. Now, the one thing to really enjoy about driving a Ford Escort is the lovely weights of the controls. Everything is just, just feels nice. Steering is direct, but not too sensitive. The throttle is just well placed and the seating position is pretty good too. It's all just really easy and enjoyable to drive. Now, of course, we don't have power steering. Now, this didn't come with Escort for a long time, actually. So we have a steering wheel that's you know, appropriately sized for low speed maneuvers. It's not too heavy. Other complaints that people would have are about the automatic choke, the VV, notorious. Apparently the diaphragms inside fail and it never really sets the choke right. Ours, having said all of that, actually seems to work all right. Ready for the Escort's launch, Ford had a brand new engine, the CVH. That came in 1.3 and 1.6 litre uh, iterations for the Escort. This was an overhead cam, overhead valve, aluminium block engine, and it had even self-adjusting tappets. It was quite an advanced engine for the time, and has since been criticised quite a lot. And I think maybe too much, because from where I'm sitting, it's a smooth unit. 1.3 litres and makes 69 horsepower. It's a gem of an engine. I don't see what the, uh, the criticism is about. Okay, there's some maintenance issues that some people talk about, but once you have it fully fettled, it's just a lovely thing and it revs smoothly. Even with the earlier cars, four-speed gearbox, it's just third. Let's listen to how turbine smooth it is at higher revs. Now, it may not be an XR or an RS, but this little 1.3L is still an absolute hoot to drive. Oh, the engine's lovely and smooth. It makes a decent amount of power and you can get it going at a proper pace down the road. The steering is nice and sharp and it feels planted. You can definitely feel the benefit of the independent rear suspension, how it goes over the bumps. The damping is maybe a little bit to be desired, but man, yeah, people would have had fun in these back in the day, still. People want the XRs and the RSs, and those are the ones that go for money. If you want an XR3i, you're looking at, what, five, uh, maybe upwards to 10 grand for a nice one. RS1600i's, well, they're a bit special. They can be five grand even more on top of an XR3i. Ford people know what they want, and often those are the 1.6 gears, because that was the one to have, if not an XR. But even cars like this 1.3L Junior Salesman Special, well, people are starting to get the memories flooding back, the nostalgia. And that's why these things are two, three, four, five grand often. The only way is up. Well, that all makes sense. This is a 40-year-old car now. That means it's not just a used car, it's a classic car, and it has to be approached as such. This particular model, when we bought it, it was pretty solid. It was an honest car, but it had a few imperfections around the edges. Finding one in that kind of condition is actually more difficult than you think. We put an unleaded head on, um, gave a bit of a touch up, got rid of some of the rust blisters and things like that, and a full valet. 40 years of dirt inside the interior had taken its toll. <laughs> You see the difference? Yeah, it's noticeable. You'd think being a Ford, parts supply would be easy, but sourcing a couple of these actually proved to be more difficult than we realized. We eventually found some on eBay, pattern parts. And when we went to fit them, they wouldn't quite go, something was off. That's because the inside casing hadn't been replicated perfectly. So there was no choice but to actually crack ever so slightly the unit as it went in, both sides. 
It's little things like that you don't think about. So what about the future of the Mark III Escort? Does it match up against the Mark I or Mark II? I think it does. It's just a few years behind. There's the same level of fondness and appreciation for this car. The number of waves and hellos you get. People coming up to go, oh yeah, I had one of those. Um, and the color, oh, Celtic bronze. Fantastic. Really, really nice to have a, a car in a period color. Are values gonna go up? I think they will only slowly because as I said they made so many and so quite a few remain on the road today but the overarching point is just because it looks modern doesn't make it not a classic I think it definitely is